Turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 again this evening and moving along in our series of studies under the, the heading Be Not Ignorant. And I've been doing this for several months now and of course the last few messages we have been concerned with Paul's admonition to us to be not ignorant concerning concluding events. And uh, several things fall under uh, that particular designation in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5 deal with uh, some matters that we're calling concluding events. And to this point, we have uh, spent some time looking at the matter of physical death in view of the fact that it is the concluding event of physical life. And it's an event that will come to all of us if the Lord does not come first. Uh, at, at some point in time, we will all experience physical death. And we've talked a little bit about that and what, what's involved with that, and as well as uh, looked at some of the admonition here uh, for those of us that are alive and remain uh, concerning those that have already fallen asleep in Jesus. And I uh, tried to understand some things around that. And then we spent some time also speaking on the topic of the resurrection of the dead. Right? We're not to sorrow as others which have no hope, but there's a hope of resurrection concerning those which sleep in Jesus. And so we talked a little bit about the resurrection of the dead. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15 gave us some information on that. And we talked about uh, the resurrection in view of prophecy and what prophecy set forth about that. We talked about uh, resurrection and con concerning the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Of course, after having died for our sins and was buried, he rose again the third day and talked about the relationship of uh, his resurrection to those that are Christ that is coming. And um, we've uh, also talked a little bit about uh, the, uh, the revelation of the mystery and its relationship to the matter of resurrection and how that some things were given to Paul by the word of the Lord in a mystery related to the resurrection, which directly concerns us as members of the body of Christ. And he discloses some details about how that's going to take place in the redemption of our body, not only here in 1 Thessalonians 4, but in 1 Corinthians 15, as we were talking about it last time. And so uh, all these subjects get touched on, right? The, the issue of those that sleep physical death, uh, the resurrection in connection with our rapture, and then Paul's also going to be talking about some things in relation to the day of the Lord and being able to properly place these things in view of God's time schedule for man. And so that's what we're working through as we're talking about these concluding events. And in the last three messages or so, we've explored those topics and we're going to advance that a little bit further tonight with yet another step. And we're going to be focusing mainly tonight on the topic of our rapture. All right, we've dealt with this issue of physical death, and we've talked about the rapture a little bit, uh, but we're going to focus on it, and especially what's set forth uh, to us here in our text passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and um, got some things we want to try to learn and see what the Lord has for us tonight concerning uh, this hope that we have of the rapture and the coming of the Lord for us. And so we'll get that underway tonight by reading the text as we usually do, beginning in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul again writing says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, to this point, we have uh, essentially been endeavoring to work our way down through this text, and that's essentially what I've done in the last messages. I know we've gone to some other passages, but... Uh, I've been trying to take the, the, the main idea of each one of these verses and the thoughts that are progressing here in 1 Thessalonians 4 and kind of using that as a springboard to go to some of these other passages that provide extra color and understanding to the topic that Paul is trying to communicate uh, to the Thessalonian saints in particular in view of uh, this matter of uh, the, the, the passing of their loved ones and so forth. And according to that guide, we've worked our way down through about the end of verse 15 at this point. And we've uh, talked about, as I said a moment ago, about the, the topic of physical death and the issue of resurrection. And uh, we've made it down through uh, the, the, the thought process to verse 15. And I guess you could really uh, attach verse 17 to it as well because we did touch on the ordering of the resurrection last week. 
and uh, toward the end. And so verse 17, we've kind of talked about that a little bit as well. And so when you're looking at this section here at the end of chapter 4, really verse 16 is what's left in this section to, to talk about and to address a little bit. And verse 16, at least in my understanding, is the primary uh, concern of communicating the mechanics of our rapture. And it gives some of the precursory details that lead into Paul's description of the redemption of our body. And he's, he's setting forth the ordering of some events that are going to take place, which ultimately leads to, as he'll say at the end of verse 16 there, where the dead in Christ rise first, and then we which are alive and remain are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, right? And so that's, that's the target of where he's going, but before he gets there, he's going to lay out some things that, that kind of lead up to that issue, right? The, the, the things that he wants you to understand, right? He doesn't want you to be ignorant of these things. He wants you to understand these things, and he's going to lay out some details of the mechanics of how all this is going to be brought to pass, right? We know the loved ones that have uh, fallen asleep in Jesus, that they have physically died, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We understand from last week that there's a resurrection hope that we have because Jesus died and rose again. And in connection with the mystery that we're called in connection with, with that gospel, there's a, a particular resurrection that we have a hope of where we're going to be reunited with them. And they're not going to be missing out on anything because they preceded us in death. And we've got that hope. And he's been talking in this line of thinking, but he, he doesn't want us just to stop there. He wants you to understand and not to be ignorant of some specific things that are going to be happening so that you can place that, understand when that's going to be happening, and so that as you understand when and the, the, the how and the why that's involved in the things that lead up to that resurrection, you're not shaken in mind by the things that are happening around you or misinterpreting those things, but you've got a clear-cut uh, ordering, so to speak, of events that are going to be taking place that is ultimately going to result in the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of our bodies that are alive and remain where we're caught up together to be there with the Lord. And so in verse 16, he's laying out some of the details about that. And the reason that he's giving you that detail is because understanding those, those aspects of the mechanics of how it's going to take place are designed to be uh, part of what effectually works in you to produce this hope that these words are supposed to give you. You remember he started off this whole, this whole issue is that the, the people are sorrowing and he doesn't want them to sorrow even as others which have no hope. The words are designed to bring about comfort. And he'll reiterate that as you get down to the last verse there of uh, chapter 4 where he says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. The design in all of the words that he's given here and everything that he's saying is for the purpose of giving you hope and providing you comfort. And so he's not just giving you some stale details of the coming of the Lord and what's going to be involved in that and letting you understand where that's supposed to be placed, you know, as just some exercise in theology or in events. No, understanding those things and the ordering of it and how it's going to take place is meant to be understood so that it provides comfort and hope in relation to these concluding events. Right? There's hope in that. There's, that's part of the effectual working of the doctrine that he's communicating. And so, in his mind, the way that he's, he's conveying this is he wants the Thessalonians and us by extension to understand that the hope that he's talking about, even in resurrection, is not just a general hope. Even understanding the mystery nature of it and what had been given to him by the Lord and in relation to the resurrection and all, it's, it's not just this generic hope of we have a, a hope of resurrection at, at some point that this is going to be. You know, that's good and that's true. But there are some specifics to that that he doesn't want us to be ignorant of. Uh, a hope in that, which he's communicating, in which that hope also involves a salvation from some things. A hope that involves some salvation uh, from some things that it makes it all the more blessed. Right? There's another scripture that calls this event of the rapture and would term that our blessed hope. Right? We have a hope in Christ. And there's, there's a blessedness to that hope. And there's varying aspects of what makes that hope so blessed. Yes, it's resurrection and that hope. And it's the, the hope of uh, reunification with those that have gone on before. That's a good hope and that's a good comfort. But there's additional aspects to the blessedness that the, 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 the Lord and especially uh, the, the Father has 
put into this event through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that when it's properly understood, it's, it's meant to, to bring about a, a hope where you understand the, the multifaceted blessedness of the hope that's ours in connection with this event of the rapture. And so it's not to be a dry doctrine. There's a salvation hope in connection with it. And Paul will even allude to that a bit as you read on down through in chapter 5 and so forth. And he talks about some other things. He'll come back to it as you look at verse 8 of chapter 5. He says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. All right, so you've still got that concept of hope that he's trying to impart through the words that he's communicating. But he talks about this helmet that he wants you to put on that functions as a hope of salvation. All right, salvation is in the hope. A particular kind of salvation that he has in mind. He goes on to explain that further in verse 9 where he says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Right, there's a salvation in this hope that he's talking about. And the salvation, of course, is salvation from wrath. Salvation from wrath. We've not been appointed to wrath. We've been appointed to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's part of your hope. Right? And that, that's what you're to wear as the hope of salvation, as a helmet upon your head. Right? The agent of thinking, your mind. There's going to be some tribulations that are coming in against that, some fiery darts that are coming in against that, especially when you're confronted with the issue of having your loved ones pass away and you're, you're, you're dealing with the shock of physical death and all of that that we talked about that has a, the potential to really rattle your mind and you begin to despair and to become hopeless. He says, no, God has given us some doctrine in the word in connection with our rapture, our blessed hope, where you're to wear that as... A helmet of the hope of salvation. With a confident expectation and understanding that we have not been appointed to wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And the salvation that he's talking about there is not primarily talking about the issue of the salvation of your soul and spirit in terms of eternal life. Right, we have that. Being justified by faith, we are saved. We have eternal life right now as a present possession of God's grace. We've now received the atonement, right, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in our stead. We have the imputed righteousness of God. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. We've got the hope of salvation right now. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about that in the gospel that he declares. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, uh, which also I preached unto you. And wherein you stand, he said... By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. Right? We're saved right now. A present possession of God's grace in our soul and in our spirit. But when he talks about the hope of salvation, he's not talking about the salvation of your whole soul and spirit. Like we, we hope that we're saved in the end. No, we're saved now. The hope of salvation is in, written in the context of some things that he's communicating here in relation to bodily presence. That's really the context of what's been going before, right? Because he's been talking about the issue of resurrection, likening sleep to death and resurrection to being awake. The issue is the body there. And it's not soul sleep. We've talked about that in, in weeks past. The part, that, the part of you that's sleeping in relation to physical death is that body. And the whole context of the doctrine is about the, the body being raised up, right? Then that sleep being raised in resurrection to be awake. And those of us that are alive and remain having that change that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talked about, the redemption of the body in connection with this rapture. And there's, there's a, a salvation that God has ordained for the church, the body of Christ, in the body. In relation to some things that God has on the, the calendar for man going forward, there's a hope that we have in that resurrection, in that body, in that redeemed body, where we're going to have a salvation. A really a physical salvation from some things. And that's part of the hope. Now we're going to talk about that a little bit and look at some of the specifics, especially there in verse 16. But before we get to that, I wanted to just kind of put this, this, Doctrine of Paul within the context of our, a timeline, okay? And th this is a, a fairly high-level timeline, but I at least want to get the basic structure of the biblical timeline 
Not that you don't know it, but so that we're thinking about where we stand on the timeline in relation to what's being communicated here. Okay? And so we've got our basic timeline starting back with the creation of heaven and earth, running all the way through to the millennial kingdom of a thousand years, and then out into eternity. All right? So really from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis all the way out past the Revelation is our timeline. Now, according to the need to rightly divide the word of truth, as our apostle tells us to do in Ephesians chapter 2, he gives us that threefold breakdown of the timeline. All right? That's time past, but now, and ages to come. All right? That's the tenses of time. Past, present, and future. There's a time past in God's word. It runs from Genesis to the midpoint of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7, there was the stoning of Stephen that concerns Israel. Prophecy. God's purpose on earth. There's, but now, which is an interruption to the prophetic timeline. That's where we presently live. We call that the dispensation of the grace of God. God's ministering grace and peace to the entire world apart from Israel here. And the issue is not Israel, but the body of Christ, where there is neither Jew nor Gentile. But then there's ages to come out here where the issue is Israel and prophecy once again. All right, so we've got that threefold breakdown. Time passed, but now, ages to come. All right? So, laid in on this timeline as well, we've got those resurrections we were talking about last week. Right, Christ, the first fruits, when he dies and he's buried and rises again. A prophecy talked about after Christ, the first fruits, they that are Christ at his coming, which was identified as the, right, uh, the resurrection of the righteous over here. They're raised ahead of the kingdom to go in and reign with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead live not until after the thousand years, which is that resurrection of damnation, where they're raised after the thousand years, face the great white throne, cast into the lake of fire. And then you're out in eternity. And then, of course, Paul talked about, behold, I show you a mystery, which is in connection with God's mystery purpose here and our rapture. So when we're talking about the rapture, we're talking here at the end of the dispensation of grace, the end of the but now, before ages to come, we're looking at this resurrection associated with our rapture, which we're caught up to be with the Lord. Okay? So that's the gist of what's on this timeline here. And there's a lot that could be said about the timeline, of course, but the main thing that I'm wanting to remind you of with this is that as you look at this picture, you've got a continuous timeline, but the dispensation of grace in which we live today, that's a time gap or an interruption, so to speak, in prophecy. Paul identifies this as a mystery. It was something that was not spoken about by the prophets. It was not spoken about by anyone until it was given to the apostle Paul by special revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? It's a mystery. It's an interruption. You take this mystery out, you can slide the timeline over, and prophecy continues on. And that was the expectation when nobody knew about this. Right, you're back here in time past, the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he's rejected by Israel, and crucified, and buried, and he rises again. It's about a year period of time following his ascension back to the Father, where repentance is offered to Israel. You've got the early Acts period in there, where repentance is offered to Israel, giving them an opportunity to change their mind concerning Jesus as their Messiah under the ministry of the Holy Ghost and through Peter and the apostles testifying there and they are rejecting that. Right, three times in the early chapters of the book of Acts Israel's given opportunity to repent and to change their mind concerning the identity of their Messiah and Jesus of Nazareth and they end up blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Right, they ultimately do that through the stoning of Stephen there in Acts chapter 7. And at the end of Acts chapter 7, when he's looking up into heaven about to be stoned, he says that I see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Right? When he was, after he ascended, he had sat down at the Father's right hand. But by the time you come to the end of Acts 7, he's standing up on the Father's right hand. And that indicates the fulfillment of prophecy from the 110th Psalm where it was said that he would sit on the Father's right hand until it was time for him to make his foes his footstool. Right. The expectation is that when he's standing at the Father's right hand, what proceeds from that is the immediate start of this final section of the prophetic timeline with Israel where he's going to return and to execute wrath and vengeance upon his enemies. 
those that have rejected him, those that have really sent back the message there in the early Acts period, the message of war. We're not going to change our mind. They have declared war on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost there. And the, the people of Israel, along with the Gentiles, are sending the message back to heaven of a declaration of war and rejection. And according to prophecy, when Christ stands at the Father's right hand, prophetically, that's exactly what he was preparing to give them. And what prophecy called to be given to them. Warfare, wrath, destruction. Right? In flaming fire, he returns, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Prophetically, that's what was set to take place and what was revealed to take place. But instead of that taking place, and the Lord Jesus Christ returning to execute wrath, he appears to Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus road, saves him according to grace, right? That chief blasphemer, his chief enemy, he saves him by grace on the Damascus road, commissions him as the apostle of the Gentiles, and through Paul begins to reveal this mystery where there's a gospel now that's being proclaimed to all the world, the, wor the wrath-worthy world of God's enemies, that God is extending grace and peace, and there can be reconciliation for all that will believe this gospel that Christ has given Paul to preach. And as long as this mystery period, this dispensation of grace is in effect, what is being held off is that wrath. Now the grace and peace here does not cancel that, right? But it does hold it in abeyance. There's something standing in the way here that is withholding that wrath being poured out. Where God's not dealing with men according to that. Now men deserve that wrath. They're worthy of that wrath. The whole world deserved that wrath. All the way back there in Acts chapter 7. The world was right for it. God would have been right in pouring it out. But in his mercy, he extends the offer of grace and peace through Paul's gospel to all of his enemies. Right When we were enemies, the message of the gospel of grace and peace came to us with the offer of God that if you'll believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, you can be saved eternally. And you can be made part of this new creation that I'm forming called the church, the body of Christ, where there is no Jew nor Gentile. Right? No difference as there was in time past. You can be, part, be made part of that. And that's what God's doing today. It's now, it's now is the time of the dispensation of grace. But understand that this dispensation of grace here is not forever. At this time it's characterized as the long suffering of God. And that's what he's doing here. He's suffering long with the wrath worthiness and the sinfulness of man looking to bring about salvation. And he's long suffering. And he's been suffering it for, uh, you know, 2,000 plus years now. Long suffering of God toward his enemies. But while there's long suffering here, we must remember that it's not forever suffering. There will come a day when the offer of grace and peace is concluded. And what's on the other side of the door of this offer of grace and peace is that wrath. That wrath is still out there. Yep. And so it's, it's important to keep that in mind in view of what Paul is talking about and dealing with here. That what is on the other side of this, when this is no longer withholding and standing in the way, what's coming upon the world is that prophesied wrath in the ages to come. And that, that understanding of the dispensational context in which Paul is speaking to people that have been reconciled to God and made members of the body of Christ here about this hope that they have in connection with the mystery and the resurrection and this event of our rapture. He, he's talking about it in this period of time, looking at this event with an understanding of what comes on the other side of that. That's important to keep in mind in view of what he's going to set forth here. And so... With that general framework in your mind, cast your eyes now to verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 4, where he's talking about this event of the rapture. And we're going to look at some specifics here, and I don't know if we'll have time to look at everything that we want to talk about in this verse, but we're going to 
uh, at least start breaking this down and look at some of the things that he communicates. So, verse 16 of chapter 4 again. Notice how he starts off here. He says, in connection with our rapture, he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Okay? So the whole thing that starts this event of our blessed hope or our rapture is that the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven. Heaven is where he's at now. Right, seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. But there's coming a time when he's going to descend from heaven. Right? The Lord's coming. He's talking about coming here because we're going to go to meet the Lord in the air. He's coming here. And he's going to descend from heaven. Now, in the way that he phrases that, I think that in and of itself is supposed to be part of the comfort of for our hearts in relation to what this event is bringing about. He's going to go on to give some other details about it, but the way that he starts it all out is he says, I want you to understand, members of the body of Christ, that in connection with this event of your rapture, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Now, notice that he did not just say that the Lord shall descend from heaven. Now, he could have said that. The verse would make sense if he had said it that way. The Lord shall descend from heaven. It would have been right. It would have made sense. But that's not the way he says it. Now, he says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. The, the point in that is adding additional emphasis to the personal nature of that coming. Right? The Lord himself is coming for us. The personal coming, right? The, the Lord is coming for us. And you start to think about that, right? Don't, don't have that to be lost on you. Because it would be easy to do to just pass over and to read it and go on to some other things that you might find more interesting. But listen to what he's saying there. The Lord himself is coming for us. The Lord himself. That's, that's a personal coming that he's talking about, right? He's coming in presence. When it's time to call us home, he's coming in presence. What a thought. What a glorious thing to think about that the Lord himself is going to so honor us by showing up himself Amen. to make sure that what that event is supposed to accomplish gets fully accomplished. He's going to see to it himself that his objective in that is accomplished. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Now you remember when Paul talks about the Lord, he's talking about the one who is the creator of every creature in heaven and earth. Not only the birds and the beasts and mankind, but also the angels, principalities and powers and heavenly places. The Lord's the one who created all of those. When he speaks of the Lord, he's talking about the one who has thousands upon thousands of angelic attendants that stand ready to carry out his will. At a moment's notice. When he speaks of the Lord, he's talking about the one who sits in the place of authority at the Father's right hand, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named. All power is delivered unto him, and he's got the authority to be able to speak and have any one of his creatures to carry out his will. But when it comes to our rapture, the Lord is not content to let any other creature take care of what's got to get accomplished. He's not sending angels to come get us, beloved. He's not even choosing the mightiest of the mighty angels to send them to see to it that it gets done. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. That, that, that communicates not only the personal nature of his coming... But also the importance of this event to him. Now it's important for us. Believe me. It's important for us for a whole lot of reasons. But don't get lost in the fact of thinking about what it means for you. To, to, to overlook the fact that the Lord himself is zealous about what that's supposed to accomplish. He says I'm going to go see to it myself. That my purpose in it gets accomplished. Because I want to go and I want to see my body. 
the body of Christ. All of the saints throughout the years, those that have been resurrected, those that are alive and remain changed in a moment, caught up to be with the Lord in the air, the Lord says, I'm coming myself for you. If you muse on that for a while and just let that work in your spirit real good, I think there's some comfort in just that much. The blessedness that's associated with the fact that it's going to be the Lord himself that comes for us. And because it's he that is coming, he himself is coming, it's he that we should be looking for. Don't let this naming convention or concept of the rapture just turn into a stale event for you. Mm -hmm. The rapture is an event, right? The blessed hope is an event. Don't get me wrong. It is an event in time. But really what we're looking for is not an event. We're looking for him because he's coming. The Lord himself is coming. And the way that Paul talks about it is not just looking for an event. He says that we look for the Savior. Right? He's in heaven. He says that our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Upper taker, not the undertaker. To Titus, Paul said it like this. He says, looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're looking for Him. We're waiting for Him. Part of the blessedness of the hope is that He's coming. He's coming. We're going to see Him. Go to be with Him. Meet the Lord in the air, you see. There's comfort in that. Part of the blessedness is the personal coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For us. Not only that, he's going to communicate some things that will take place when he comes. If you look at verse 16 again, he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. So three widths are mentioned in this verse. When the Lord himself comes, he descends from heaven, he's going to come with three things that he lists here. Number one, he's going to come with a shout. Number two, he's going to come with the voice of the archangel. And number three, he'll come with the trump of God. Now, those things communicate a whole lot, I think. There's, there's a whole lot packed into those statements. And there's references that we can go to and some of them that we will go to as we progress through the study. But a whole lot's communicated right there. And I think the way that I want to impart to you what I think this is talking about is I'm just going to state it. Right? We're just, we're just, I'm just going to tell you what I think these three, th three things relate to. And then we'll go to some other passages to try to substantiate it. And I probably won't get to all of them this week, but try to give you some background for why I come to that conclusion. And, uh, of course, if uh, you agree, praise the Lord. If you think it's something else, then I'm open to anything anybody has to say. But I think I've got... At least a, a sound understanding of what this could be related to. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. So let me just state what I think these three things are. And then we'll start looking at some of the verses with the remaining time. So first of all, the Lord is going to come with a shout. All right, that's number one, the shout. When he comes with a shout, I believe that that shout is the order to, uh, to recall Christ's ambassadors and to end the dispensation of grace. He's going to give forth a shout, and that's going to be an order to recall his ambassadors from this world, and it's going to be what ends the dispensation of grace. All right? Secondly, he says he's coming with the voice of the archangel. Right? The voice of the archangel. The archangel is beginning to say some things, in other words. You hear his voice again in connection with this event. I believe that the voice of the archangel is given for the assembling of the angelic host of the Lord to the battle, indicating that Israel's program is now going to resume. And then he says he's going to come with the trump of God, which is the most explained and probably the most obvious of the list. And the trump of God relates to the resurrection blast of the trumpet that will raise the dead and catches the body of Christ into the heavenly places. Right. And we talked a little bit about that in 1 Corinthians 15 last week. So the shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. 
the shout, the order to recall Christ's ambassadors, and ends the dispensation of grace. The voice of the archangel is the assembling of the angelic host of the Lord to the battle, indicating God's program with Israel is resuming. And the trump of God, the resurrection blast to raise the dead and to change those that are alive and remain as we go to be with the Lord in the heavenly places. So, we're going to look at that, look at some of the background for it, and show you why we come to those conclusions. And so, let's just take the first one, and that may be all the time that we have uh, for the study tonight. But first of all, we learned that when the Lord himself descends from heaven, the, the Apostle Paul says that he's coming with a shout. He's coming with a shout. Now, when you start looking for the definition of what this shout is in reference to, what I believe you'll find is that the shout is often associated with an order or a command that arouses movement or change. Right? It's an order or a command that arouses movement or change. Oftentimes in a battle context, you'll find that a shout is a stimulating war cry. It's a war cry. And it's meant to signal to soldiers to engage in the battle or to move into place or to take alternate action to what has been given to them before. It's a signal shout or, or a command where it's going uh, to change some things. Right? So some things are being reordered, as it were, by the shout and the order of the command that comes. You'll find that shouting in the Bible is also associated with victory and triumph and rejoicing. It's associated with the presence of a victorious king or prince that comes into the midst of the assembly of his people. He comes from the battle and he's got the spoils of war and he comes back amongst his people. And there's a great shout of victory and triumph and rejoicing over what's taken place. In terms of animal representation, you might think of the lion. The strongest among beasts, the proverb says. And there's obvious connections between lions and the, the issue of the king. But if you were talking about a shout in that kind of context, you might think of, of the shout of a lion as being the roar of a lion. He roars after his prey. Or he'll, uh, he, he'll roar and instill that it's a battle cry or a shout of victory or a signal uh, that arouses things to a changed state. We can see a few examples of this. If you'll come with me back to the book of Numbers, chapter 23, I'll show you a verse here that links up the concept of a uh, shout among the people in connection with a uh, king and his presence. Numbers chapter 23, this is within the context of uh, Balaam and Balak and the, the uh, desire of Balak who uh, hires Balaam to basically curse the children of Israel. Right? They've, they've come in here and they've decimated the Amorites and uh, the word has gotten out that Israel's destroyed their enemies and Balak doesn't want them coming in to destroy him and his power, his kingdom. And so he's going to hire this false prophet named Balaam to go and to essentially curse this people, right? Curse my enemies, okay? And there's this whole uh, scenario that's recorded for us here in the book of Numbers and it's within that context that we find these verses. And our purpose is not to necessarily deal with the context of what's happening here, but just to see the, the usage of that shout concept here. So uh, Numbers 23, begin at verse 18. It says, And he took up uh, his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Right, the shout of a king is among them. Right, this is in the context of Israel has done valiantly. They've triumphed over the enemies, the Amorites, and they've wiped the floor with them in the power of God. And this whole concept is, is falling out from that. And he's wanting, he's wanting the false prophet to curse the people, but he says, the Lord won't allow me to curse. He's blessed, and I can't reverse it. And he says in connection with this, that his, the Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. The shout of victory, triumph, rejoicing within that context. How about Joshua chapter 6? Joshua chapter 6, again, 
The children of Israel now, later on in their history, where Joshua's bringing them into the land and they're coming up to the city of Jericho. I'll read some of the verses, but the Lord's going to have them walk uh, around the city uh, before he gives them the victory. If you notice Joshua chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. It says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all your men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark uh, seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they shall make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend every man straight before him. Uh, look down at verse 10. And Joshua, uh, and Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout. Nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then ye shall shout, or then shall ye shout. All right, so they're marching around the city, supposed to be doing that in complete silence. That's the order of the way things are supposed to be. Don't say anything, just march around in silence. But there's going to come a signal where I say, shout, and when the signal comes, you shout. All right, there's a change an alternate action that is to take place in connection with the signal. You shout. Verse 16. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. So you're seeing this shouting in the, the uh, warfare context. Verse 20. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so the people went up into the city, every man straightway before him, and they took the city. Right, so you're seeing shouting in, in the context of warfare, right? that war cry concept, uh, a signal that's arousing movement and it's arousing change, bringing it about as a result of the shout. Uh, Psalm 47, and there's, there's other passages we can go to, but I'll probably cease with this one. Psalm 47 Verse 1, Psalmist says, Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Right, so now you've got the triumph concept linked with the shout. Verse 2, For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. Right, so he's talking about the Lord causing him to triumph, and he's reigning among the nations. Right? He's going into this, this issue of the kingdom. The king's among his people. As he's describing that in verse 5, he says, God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. And so in connection with the kingdom, him, him going up into the kingdom, that triumph, God has gone up with a shout. The prophets will talk about the Lord roaring as a lion over his habitation. You can find some other references there, things that are connected with that shout. Now, all these, these passages that we just looked at, the, the point was just seeing some of those associations that I was describing, generally speaking, so that you understand that when the, the shout is talked about, it's oftentimes associated with that, that signal or that, that command that arouses things to change. Things start moving, things start happening in connection with that signal shout. Okay. Now you say, well, what does that have to do with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Well, I think that we need to understand the general point of the shout so that we can bring that back to the context of what Paul's communicating concerning the rapture and what's happening in relation to that event. 
Because he said that when the Lord himself descends from heaven, it's going to be with a shout. Okay? Now, understanding that shout and what is being changed and what's happening, I think, you've got you to put yourself in the, the mindset of what it is that the body of Christ actually is to the Lord in this present time. What are we for the Lord who's going to be coming with that shout? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this will be the last passage that we go to tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Who are we as the body of Christ for the Lord in this dispensation? And what ministry is it that he has us fulfilling today? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse number 18 is where I'll start. Paul says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right. So in verse 20, Paul says of the body of Christ that we are ambassadors for Christ. We're his ambassadors. We're heaven's representatives in a foreign land, this foreign land that we would call this present evil world. Right, we currently live in a world of God's enemies. Right, isn't that what we said earlier? Right there in Acts chapter 7. The people of Israel and the Gentiles come together, send the message of warfare back after him. They declared war on the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. The world, the wrath-worthy world, has declared war on God. We're his enemies. And instead of giving them the war and the wrath that was due them according to prophecy, what happened? St. Paul gave him the message of grace, sent him forth to proclaim this gospel, a gospel of grace and peace to a wrath-worthy world of his enemies. A message of reconciliation. Right? God did some things in Christ there by the cross where a message of reconciliation is being sent to the world, starting with Paul, and those that believe Paul's gospel and are reconciled to God, right? Enemies that are reconciled to God by grace. He says, now, you living in this present evil world, you are ambassadors for Christ, and you've got a ministry in this world, and that is the ministry of reconciliation. You're heaven's ambassadors to the world of his enemies, ministering a message of grace and peace so that they can be reconciled. That's what we do by preaching the gospel. Preaching the message of grace. Right? We're representing the heavenly Christ in a world of his enemies. Yeah. Ambassadors for Christ. And that's what we're doing throughout the duration of this time. God's being long-suffering. God is desirous to have all men reconciled unto himself. His will is that all would be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. He's made a provision for the world to be reconciled unto himself through his Son. The redemptive work of Christ there provided for some things where God could reconcile the world to himself, to all that will believe and come. You can be reconciled. And as his ambassadors with this ministry of reconciliation, we're beseeching men in God's stead, be ye reconciled to God. The provision has been made. The blood has been shed. God is willing to forgive you. God is willing to reconcile you and to impute righteousness to you and give you all spiritual riches and heavenly places in Christ. Everything's been provided for. Be ye reconciled to God. Or as ambassadors for that. And under that purpose. And that's all fine and well and wonderful. And would to God that men would be reconciled and come to the knowledge of the truth of the gospel of grace. But as we said earlier, the long-suffering of God and the offer of grace and peace is not going to continue forever. There is coming a point when God is going to give that wrath-worthy world the wrath and the war that they're demanding as his enemies. 
And so when the time for that comes, after grace and peace is over, when it's time to wrap that up, take that off the table, the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout. He's going to give a command to have all those ambassadors with the ministry of reconciliation to withdraw. Right? Recall the ambassadors of grace and peace out of enemy territory. And that's what would happen when the time for war is there. Right? You don't go to war with your ambassador still in the foreign land. When all of the diplomacy is over, all of the negotiation, so to speak, is over, grace and peace is no longer the, the offer. That's not the ministry of God anymore. This is over. It's time to have my ambassadors come out of there because now it's time for war. And what's happening here when the Lord descends from heaven, he gives that shout. That's the recall to all these ambassadors here. Grace and peace is over. The ministry of reconciliation is over. There is no longer any need for the ambassadors of Christ to be in that foreign land because war is coming. Come on home. And the shout is the indication that the dispensation of grace is over. A rousing movement, a rousing to change. Now the message is not grace and peace any longer. The message is prepare war. Wrath's coming. Amen. And the ambassadors are called out with a shout. And so what he's telling you there is the timing in which our wrath has taken place. Right? That is the event that concludes the dispensation of grace. That's why we're being called up into the, into the air to, to meet the Lord there. To, to get out of this present evil world there's a salvation in that right, didn't he say that we have not been appointed to wrath we've been appointed to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ see that, that's part of the blessedness as well it's an understanding of when the resurrection is supposed to take place when that reunification is going to take place it's what ends the dispensation of grace and you've got the hope of being taken out when the Lord himself descends from heaven with that shout. As we'll see, he goes on with the next phrase with the voice of the archangel, which has some significance to this as well. The archangel and specifically a ministry that's related to the wrath. And that indicates that Israel's program is going to be the issue again, which is what we've got represented up here. And then the trump of God in connection with that resurrection and we'll work through that and look at some other passages but tonight we just wanted to kind of get this underway and start looking at this topic of our rapture put that within the dispensational context and understanding that he's, he's communicating this so that you can position in your mind exactly when all that's going to take place and the fact that we're going to be called out and have that hope of salvation from that wrath we'll say some more about that in the weeks to come amen amen, amen. hope that was a help to you tonight we'll close in prayer our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the time tonight. We thank you for the saints. We pray that you take this word, minister it to hearts, and may it be uh, useful in the, the foundation for the things we'll look at in the weeks to come. We give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.